Thanks to the energy shift during harmonic convergence, certain people have acquired airbending abilities. The recaps being in this, nya, it's the 19 whatevers voice and style doesn't really fit the show anymore, I feel. And I know I've made this point before, but it feels even deeper now because the world focuses on those elements even less. Back in season one, sure, fit right in since the show was so dedicated to that aesthetic and look and sound, honestly. Even the soundtrack was different, but since the start of season two, it doesn't really fit, and even less now since the show is leaning more into the airbender world than ever. Which is another point I'll bring up again at some point. It's like, if you saw Mako and Korra walking around in these getups now, even if they were in Republic City, you'd be like, what the fuck are you wearing? The Northern Air Temple actually looks nearly identical to how it did back in Airbender. Bit of a surprise considering the facelift that the Southern Air Temple got, but I guess restoring the temples would have been big projects. Maybe Aang just didn't get around to all of them. On which island? Ooh! Ooh. Anyone besides Otaku? They named him Otaku. Alright, this is a PSA right now. If you're somehow watching this and you gladly, openly call yourself an Otaku, you've gotta pull back. Enjoy what you enjoy, don't get me wrong, but we need to be reasonable here. Whale Tail Island! A classic Whale Tail Island reference, the third one and counting. I hope we get there someday. I come seeking boring stories to take back to the spirit world. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You'll notice the Northern Air Temple still has the eldritch many-eyed sky bison statues from back in the day throughout this episode. Very nice. What about those? It's a whole herd of bisons. Actually, the plural of bison is bison. Yeah, everyone knows that. Even the mechanist. Just listen, he knows exactly what animal he's helping his son onto during the invasion. Bye, son. I ain't gonna lie, I ain't much for the monk life, but if you told me I could fly one of these things, you might convince me to be an acolyte. Like, do they get their own? I'm surprised they have any to get here on. We only ever see Oogie, but Iki does imply that there's more, so. Avatar Korra is calling on the temple radio. Hank's like, the temple what? And yeah, speaking of which, actually, it seems like there must have been some level of restoration here, because all the mechanist gizmos and whatever are never shown to be around. So he and his crew probably moved out shortly after the war, which makes sense. They're not threatened anymore. Probably better to live somewhere that there's more oxygen. We got a call about a new airbender, and it turned out to be Sue's daughter, Opal. Isn't it also a little weird that they've only heard of people in the Earth Kingdom that have received airbending? Zuko's daughter never thought to send a line and be like, we got some, there's none up north or down south, you know, near the biggest sources of spiritual energy and thus the magical harmonic convergence shit. I'm just saying, with those weird AI voices you hear and some decent lip flap editing, you could really use these two shots to make a Janet Varney, J.K. Simmons duet. And you get a little PJ Byrne feature in there too? Something soulful, you know? I'm thinking Thunderstruck. <laughs> no one seems to be interested in the hard work required to become a part of the Air Nation. You need to give yourself a break. Let Janora and the kids help you out. I mean, don't get me wrong, I like the cool head Korra has and her being interested in Tenzin's struggles, and I like the callback to this Ang line too. You're turning into a pretty wise avatar after all. Conflict resolution. It's what I do. Helping people. That's what I do. But is conflict resolution what you do? You got the Kai thing under your belt, that's fair, I'll give you that. But you better not be taking credit for the Lin Su thing. Your record is still heavily weighed in conflict instigating, I'd say. Well, I guess beating people up is a form of resolution. I wanna fly one of those bisons. I don't know. We might get in trouble. Come on, let's have some fun. We'll be back before anyone realizes we're gone. I guess it will be all right. You guess what? I guess it will be all right. Look how cute! Kai, get out of there! Keska, fuck, it's the one with the broken horn. That one wasn't wild, that was one of the ones inexplicably raised by the fire sages. Yeah, it could reasonably be a different one with a broken horn, I know, but like, what the fuck? Oh, and there goes the staff. Then why don't you have tattoos like an airbending master? My dad says I'm not a master yet. You can do everything your dad can. Plus, you have all those spirity powers. If anyone's a master, you are. The only reason you're getting away with this flirting in my video is because it plays into a thing later. You're still on notice. So, we bring the net down on the head pirate, and he looks around real sad and says, I know I should have followed my dreams and become a dentist. You know what? This one's pretty believable. I won't have to green screen attack Boomy today. Let me guess, you want to criticize me for something. Actually, I need your help. Oh yeah? Whoa, I just got forced perspective did. I did not think his finger was in his ear. Is it just me or is Boomy kinda jack? Dawn Patrol! Everyone up! Uh, what are you doing? It's 
barely light up. I think Boomy is stupid for saying these things and then not realizing he was the one that was going to get his ass kicked into gear. Anyone else? Can I get a hell yeah? The other airbenders seem to be keeping a decent pace in this quick shot, but then they're seen struggling or just straight up rock climbing in this shot. Nothing like a 10 mile hike first thing in the morning. Man, hiking sounds fun if you can leap five stories upwards. Might actually get my ass into nature if that was the case. If it weren't so cold, I'd go right back to sleep. Then this is the perfect time to learn meditation and proper breathing technique. Airbenders are able to warm themselves with only their breathing. While yes, this feat is based off of something that Tibetan monks have been recorded in doing while meditating, I still call bullshit on people that tell me Aang was cool in the South Pole because of this. One, because Tenzin implies it's only during meditation, and two, Aang wears a winter outfit in the comics. Haha, -ha, another internet argument about a fictional universe thoroughly not one, but one in the mind of the biggest nerd loser in the room. You know when I said that thing about an iron fist? Hush! Meditation time. Stop making Boomy look sad, you're not gonna make me like him. The key is to maintain your heaven and earth connection. Guru Patik is fuming right now. Get back up! What's the matter, you can't handle it, soldier? Yeah. This is the weakest bloodbending I've ever seen. I don't even know why Amon would do this. I know he's undercover here, but like, why are you bloodbending Boomy? All right, who's next? I'm not sure I want to shave my head. That's fine. Shaving your head is a personal choice. Wait, what? It's an alright joke, but I also like that Tenzin's pretty lax on some stuff still. Like, having your head shaved for the old air nomads was definitely a cultural thing, pretty expected of people, but Tenzin doesn't force that level of commitment onto anyone. This is the characterization that I expected Tenzin to have back in that dinner scene, wanting people to embrace their new roles as airbenders and the culture tied to it, but not expecting them to do anything that's personally too far for them. I feel like that's far more in line with Tenzin's character, and we didn't really need that scene of him acting out of character, even if it did sort of enable that little two-episode arc that I like for him. Airbenders move like the wind. Ah, yeah! oh, yes, the classic airbender melon cannons that Ang was always talking about. No formal military, but many melon cannons. Money more, money. Everyone is waiting for you, Boomy. If you don't make it over in the next 30 seconds, they'll all have to run through the course again. Ah! I'll say what I want about Boomy, but I gotta give it to him. Man can take a fall. Count me out! Fine, quit! We don't need your attitude in the new Air Nation! But see, now we kind of double back on Tenzin's good characterization. I know Korra told him to listen to Boomy, and he did, but once again, I feel like Tenzin is smarter than this. I got a lot of comments about that table scene, saying that my problem with it is what the episode is getting at, so I'm dumb for having a problem with it because of it. But I don't think I expressed myself well enough then. My problem is that I'm watching Tenzin act in a way that I've been led to believe that Tenzin should not act. And him getting over it in the next scene still doesn't change that. That characterization doesn't fit him, no matter how brief it is. I think Tenzin is far more intelligent than to expect most people to drop their entire lives and take up his way of living. I think we've been shown that, and once again here, I feel like Tenzin is far more intelligent than to keep pushing this approach when it's clearly not working, and not to mention, probably not in line with the culture he's trying to imprint on these people. This process means a lot to him, and he wants it to work, but can we agree that even if he's making an effort to act this way, unlike himself, Tenzin is wise enough to realize when something has gone too far or isn't working? Or are we going with Tenzin is an idiot and is blind to the ineffectiveness of this and the distance it's really putting between the people he needs to rebuild his nation and himself. I was just talking to Kai and he was asking me, so... Kai! What does he know about when you should get tattoos? I'm not a little girl anymore. I can airbend just as well as you. You can? For real? People say that, but I haven't really been shown it very much. The only thing you really have going is the spirits thing. You lose an air scooter races to your younger sister, and I'm just saying, I don't think Tenzin gets snatched like this ever. I know everything about our culture and history, and I have a stronger connection with the spirits than you ever will. Okay, all right, you got me there. I'll give you that. Hickey, Milo, you're up. Just lead them through the Bagua circle. Bagua is, of course, the real-world martial art that airbending is based on. Nice reference. Where are the babies? Oh god, he's got the net gun. Genius. That shit's really good against airbenders. Makes sense that bison poachers would have them. Please don't tell me that future Master Janora is being kidnapped again. Oh, here we go. What are these kids doing in my camp? We caught them sneaking around. We thought they might tell someone we're here. They're those new airbenders. What? The Sky Bison Pelt cape isn't that weird? Hakoda had a Sky Bison Pelt rug on one of his ships. Eh, well, actually, it looks like from this angle there's been some construction going on down here on the lower level. Didn't have these buildings back in Airbender. Focus. Breathe. Boomy ruins everything. That's sad. Tenzin also has a mantra about how shit his sibling is. You know, just because these people can airbend, it doesn't automatically make them air nomads. 
Tell me about it. See, Tenzin knows this, and is his mischaracterization in earlier scenes fixed now because he learned a lesson and gets back to where he should have been before that mischaracterization? I don't think so. This doesn't seem to be a lesson that Tenzin, who was shown to be pretty wise, would have had to learn. Besides, he already kind of learned it back in season one with Korra. That first night, I was so scared and lonely, and the bed was so hard. It's actually better for your back. You should have been briefed about this. And I know what you're thinking. We're already past the second commercial break here over Analyzing Avatar. What's going on? Don't they tend to bounce back and forth between characters and plots in these episodes? And no, no, this is the only plot for this episode. I'm not talking to you. Eh. The Earth Queen and her fancy friends paid big money for bison steaks and other weird meat. I even heard she ate her dad's pet bear. This is another line I see people get upset about, like the idea that the Earth Queen ate the bear is somehow spitting in the face of Airbender. It's like, one, you're gonna believe the most forgettable Avatar villain since this guy at face value. And two, if she did eat Bosco, like sure, that's kind of chilling and mean, but like what, Bosco is one of your favorite parts of Airbender? You run a Bosco fan cam account on TikTok? Hey, do that spirit beaming thing you did to find me. Go to the temple for help. I can't, I'm all cramped in here and I need quiet and time to focus. <laughs> yeah, all right, writers. Yeah, just write yourself out of that one. Spirits, I need your help. So, okay, Janora's Aquaman. Wait, did Janora send this spirit? Is she in trouble? Let's just work a lassie joke in here, just so everyone knows this episode is really sharp. Boomju's friend told me. You were able to communicate with the spirits? More or less, I get the gist. Let's go. I feel like Korra has introduced this weird dichotomy in what it is to be an airbender. There's bending, and then there's spirituality. And I mean, ideally, you get to be really good at both, but they treat spirituality almost like it's a video game stat or something. Like, okay, getting better at airbending is something that's easy to communicate. It's a martial art. You train, you clearly get more physically adept at it. Makes sense. But spirituality, how do you convey that someone is skilled in that, other than just saying they are and letting them do spirity stuff? Janora can inexplicably turn into an angel under the right conditions, yeah I know. Boomy has a pretty strong connection with one spirit and can even understand its weird squeaks, but why? It's just a passive thing? Sure, Janora is hella involved in the culture and readings and everything, but so is Tenzin and she has a way stronger connection than he does. Boomy doesn't give a fuck about any of this and he seems more attuned than his brother, but at the same time it's clear people can become more spiritually skilled over time due to seeing Aang and Korra get better. But there's no way to tell how or why. It really just seems that they said, fuck it, all the spiritual stuff goes unexplained. But in an episode like this, where they're exploring airbending training more, wouldn't this be the exact time to get some insight into that stuff? Looks like they're getting ready to leave. We'll have to move fast. Listen, this is what we've been training for. We haven't been training that long. That's not important now. I like to think I'm mostly fair. I have my biases, sure, just like anyone, but mostly fair. So I have to say I like this Boomy speech. I'm a sucker for a good motivational speech, though, so maybe it's not as effective as I think it is. But we definitely need more than just Boomy being a boasting childish idiot, so I welcome it. Good thing I have these two twigs I always keep on me for just such an occasion. Free the bison first. What? No, free your ally so you can be more effective in freeing the bison. Janora, do you have rocks in your head? Hey, what are you doing? Out. Honestly, just leave the airbending out. It looks like you got a pretty good armbar. The airbenders go for the exact same tactic they used against the Dai Li. That is, of course, big wind. <laughs> Now, I've never been bald, but I've always thought that having hair would make you feel the wind better because, you know, it moves and junk? No? Alright, the team air scooter is pretty sweet. Seems like it might be hard for these newbies to pull it off, but whatever. <laughs> I'm gonna say it again, stop making Janora a damsel. If she's supposed to be this nuts airbender, show me that she's this nuts airbender. Stop putting her in situations where the novice airbender, Kai of all people, needs to save her. It makes her look weak. And it's not like it would mess up their relationship dynamic or anything. Kai seems way into the fact that Janora is supposedly super good at it. Have her save him. Oh, okay, that did look pretty clean though. Have I been doing the skirt thing like I said? I feel like I haven't been. Nice touch that you can see the wild sky bison shadow on approach in this shot. <laughs> Definitely have Tenzin be the one that really saves her here, no question. And then maybe Janora can have a moment where she realizes that maybe she's not ready for her tattoos. And then that at least would play into her being mostly ineffective so far. And then at the end of the season, she could prove to her father and herself that she really is a master. I'm just saying, if we're gonna have that supposedly big emotional moment at the end, I think we should make an effort to have a bigger storyline tied to it. Maybe you boys haven't heard, but there's some new airbenders around these parts. Why is Boomy talking like it's a western all of a sudden? He called them rustlers earlier. Bison rustlers. Without my shaved head, I never could have dodged that net. I really felt it coming at me. I'm proud of you. Your connection with the spirits and natural leadership 
You remind me of Dad. They try to do a nice little moment between Boomy and Tenzin here, but it's all much too surface level and rushed. I don't think this one is as effective as the other nice wrap-ups the show has done. Does that mean I can get my airbender tattoos? It's hard for me to believe that my little girl is grown up enough to have her tattoos. But I promise I'll think about it. What are you talking about? What about this episode has taught you that? Uh, I mean, what do you want from me for this episode? It's not great. I think everyone that remembers this episode knows that, and everyone else doesn't even remember it exists. Tenzin feels out of character for most of it, and because of that, the main conflict seems pretty unreasonable. And because of that, anyone who's watched television before knows exactly how this episode is gonna go. Tenzin is gonna chill out and realize his mistake. You know that immediately. You think the episode might be saved by the airbending training, of which we didn't really get to see much with Korra, but no, not really. None of it's a bore to get through, but none of it really compels me either. It's just surface level fun visuals and jokes, and I'm looking for more out of this show. The little bison poacher thing at the end is decent fun in my mind, a unique type of villain that hits home for the airbenders, but unfortunately Kai gets the spotlight, when it should naturally be Jinora. It's an episode that's very much removed from the rest of the plot, Kor is on the phone for 30 seconds. Other than that, this is what we get, and it's not much. Pager shoutouts, if you want to see the next two episodes of Overanalyzing Kor ahead of the YouTube releases, you can support me on Patreon for just a few bucks. Link as as always, is in the description below the video. Biggest shoutouts of all go to my top patrons. A stack of pancakes who powerbombed a guy in a ski mask through a balcony. The ski resort was so impressed they didn't even charge him. Donut, who can smell if you're embezzling money. It's a lot more common than you figure. Kevin Bartolin, who was an anti-gargoyle, which means they turn into stone on a full moon, but the rest of the time they're immune to being turned into stone, so it's not bad if you ask me. Liquor Cause I Know Her, who won some money on a scratch ticket, so now their foyer has a wonderful fountain fixture, and by foyer I mean kitchen, and it takes up most of the entire place, but it's very tasteful. Omega Fighter, who was actually covered in microscopic clones of themselves, which prevents them from contracting the common cold. Cater of Tots, who likes honey so much their brain has started producing anti-venom to most insect stings. And that one Turian who got kicked out of a chili, so he bought the place and changed the matzo sticks on the menu to be named Fuck Barry. Barry was the name of the manager. And of course, my other fuck you money patrons, Blanco, Cameron Lowry, Cheap Con Queequee, Gene Cree, Gyro Like, Luna Invicta, Matthew Lang, Potato Scream, The Former Meaning of Life, The One Am Party, and Whitrow. And my god over analyzers, Two Boots Are Beat, Ang, Alan Garvin, Andrew Watchard, Aropa Taro, Axel a little syndicate, Chandler Crump, Cosmic Newbie, Deathly Healer, Dr. Xerox, Dominic Saint, Dricker, Emma Not Emma, Aaron Grace, I'm a Match, Jace, Jackson, Jeremy Rubenstein, Jaker4215, John Ajaka, Justin Scott, Mac, Medium D Speaks, Michael Fellin, Mitchell Gobrek, Nick, Nicholas Abbott, Peter Bayron, Pogger White, Revenge of the Beefsteak Tomatoes, Rocket Mist, Ryan Maxwell, Sandy Stormborn, Scoobert, Shane Antonacci, Silk Toast, Smarty Marty, Super Sniffer, Totoro Bob Rose Musical Emporium, Von Can't Spell, and some sort of bareface. Next up, let's let's get back on track.